Okay, we will start today in the morning with uh, Jerry Luinas. Uh, thank you for coming to us. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Hope you had the much rest and recovered from uh, very generous. Yesterday, at some point, uh, I used this expression when discussing typefaces, and my point was that if you're too involved in typeface design, you're not a good judge of typefaces because you have an emotional engagement, you have a vested interest. Uh, you need to be able to distance yourself a bit from what's going on. This, this one, this one's better. I have no idea. Yeah. And I'm going to give you an example. Now, I'm talking about Greek, which is uh, one of my areas of, of confidence. Uh, it's useful for you if you're not interested in Greek, because then you can make judgments about what I'm telling you without having an emotional investment. If I were talking about Armenian, you would be personally invested. If I were talking about the script that you work in intimately, you would be personally invested. So you need to try out your opinions on things that you have different degrees of emotional engagement with. And that is a measure for how clear your thinking is. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a gradual development of a style and introducing ideas of modernity and innovation in it. Now, the counterpoint of being disinterested about typeface design is being interested in typography. Because again, as typeface designers, we forget that nobody really cares about typefaces in themselves other than you. Uh, but the documents are what people are interested in. The documents are what give value to typefaces. Now, if speaking of a, about the Greek environment, most of the documents that form the identity of Greek typography are like this. This is Homer. Uh, this is from 1488. It's a very simple page. Uh, doesn't matter whether you can read it or not, but as designers of documents, you can understand what's going on there. There's an extremely simple hierarchy. This is a completely flat document. There's just text. Uh, if you look at the whole of the Homer of the Iliad, there's 24 sections in them with just endless runs of text. Uh, if you look at the whole of the Homer of the Iliad, there's 24 sections in them with just endless runs of text. If you look at religious texts, they are exactly the same kind of structure. This means that the pressure on the typeface side of the document is minimal. You just need one style to get through the text. And if these are the texts that you're reading for centuries, that's fine. Then there is no pressure on the typefaces to change their style. And here is an example from about uh, 1745. Uh, 250 years later, the same kind of document. This is Aristotle, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, but again, you see there's a heading by now, because this is a book that exists within an established framework of typography, but beyond that, there's just a simple style. There's no differentiation, there's no need to show some sort of typographic hierarchy. Here is a page from a book from the 15th century using famous Greek typeface, the Greek Trois, uh, styles cut by Garmond and Grandjean, extremely similar, which again, use just one style. There are some capitals used for some very minimal hierarchies. Importantly, these are modeled on manuscript hands. There are many different kinds of manuscript hands at the time that these types are developed. The more formal, the more prestigious one is selected for these prestigious books. Again, there is a range of styles, the appropriate one for the kind of text selected. And because there is no pressure to modify the typographic conditions, the same style gets repeated again and again. Again, if you think of the typography, the typography is always for some users. This is classical Greek, this is for literate people. Literate in the 16th century is what, 5% of the population? Uh, it's also for highly educated people. Because it's philosophy, it's men. So essentially you're talking about an extremely small part of the population which reads a fairly narrow range of documents. That means that the pressure on the change of the nature of the documents is minimal. And because it is also a prestigious document for fairly uh, see, wealthy individuals who have no problem demonstrating their wealth, the cost associated with producing these fairly complex forms is not a problem. Indeed, until fairly late, we see this idea of the connection between the manuscript forms and the sound of the surviving in a lot of scholarship. This is a plate from the 14, 
sorry, 18th, uh, 19th century, uh, explaining the nature of the written forms to students of Greek uh, in English private schools. Now, what we see here is now a typographic environment that is, in other documents, extremely complex, but for Greek maintains just one single style, which also has a quite cursive inclination. The typographic environment for composing this is quite substantial. This is half of the type cases you would need to typeset the documents I showed you before. So you can imagine six type cases arranged side by side just to typeset just one style of Greek, simply because you need to be able to provide the full complexity of the forms that all the manuscript related shapes require. If you're making slowly made documents for a very wealthy, educated population that don't need differentiation, <coughs> that is not such much of, that big of a problem. The market for these documents supports this. And you can see uh, the range of the complexity there. You also see quite a lot of combinations of three or four letters, so whole words are cast as simple sorts to imitate the written forms. When you begin to have texts that are a bit more complex in terms of scholarship, this is very much evident in the 18th century, where Greek is really a second language of scholarship uh, for educated people. Then you see embedded uses like this, where again there's just a single style for Greek. And there is no problem in differentiating the typographic texture from the Latin quite strongly because these are these words are intended to stand out. So there's no problem with combining quite different styles in our eyes for these texts. Again, this continues. This is from 1670. Uh, uh, this is a book from the 19th century that is uh, printed within Greece. Again, a fairly typical example for fairly flat hierarchy. By this time, we have shed a lot of the complexity of the forms due to the range of documents that are being produced. But if we zoom in, we'll see that there is no differentiation between the footnotes and the main text. So within very few examples, we see that the nature of the documents does not push the typographic design to introduce the styles that we expect to see. And of course, at this time, people are quite accommodating in combining things across. So as you can see, the seven and the one there that clearly come from a different type. Uh, I will also point some that you would see here that diacritics follow a capital. If you have a mental image of where you see capitals with a diacritic following them, Keep that in mind, because later I'm going to be talking about this. If you go nearly 100 years later, you see a book, this is from 2003, of a fiction text. Again, there's a footnote, but the styles are fairly consistent. So this idea of within flat hierarchy texts, maintaining a fairly consistent style that, although it has lost the complexity of the, uh, of the literatures, that does not push a lot of differentiation in weights and styles is a trend. This doesn't mean that there is no capacity for innovation. It means that the typography doesn't put pressure on the people making the typefaces to innovate. Uh, this is a very typical example of what you would consider as a complex text. This is uh, an excerpt from a lexicon from the middle of the 19th century, uh, Little Scott that is still being produced in copies and different editions. And here you can see that there is a headword. And this is the most important complexity in terms of typography that we've seen in Greek for the last 200 years until recent times. Uh, where you see a headword that needs to be referenced uh, by being darker, that's the convention, and then you might have a different style of Greek within the text. Again, here you see a combination of two separate styles that are being paired simply on the slab of the typesetter. You open a drawer that has darker Greek, you pick that one for the headword, you open a drawer with what looks like regular weight Greek, you use it for the main text. Again, this accommodation of different styles that will work quite well. Things get a bit more interesting when we have mechanical typesetting, and in this case we have an excerpt from a photo typesetting uh, specimen, which in terms of conception is simply an evolution of mechanical typesetting. Because you have a market that produces typeface <laughs> products that accompany typesetting systems in families, 
you need to have this kind of development of a typographic family. Now, in this case, uh, you can see a Greek Baskerville. This is from uh, the, well, the roots of this are the, from the early 70s, but it was produced until well into the 80s in exactly the same forms. And now you see that there is an idea that our products, that the timepieces, need to have an italic and they need to have a heavier weight. In this case, there is no bold italic uh, associated with it, simply because the typography did not expect a bold italic to be used at the time. And you could have a chat with all the typographers who would tell you that bold italic was not something that was used in any convention. So here you see the development of the idea of family, so typefaces. <coughs> Initially, by combining disparate styles, one that might be more cursory with some that might be more upright, and eventually building this with the specification for drawing the families. And this is one of these cases. But this is a fairly shallow idea of what the family is. The idea of having a regular and a slightly more cursive or slightly more differentiated secondary is not a very rich uh, design problem. Things get a bit more interesting from 1985 onwards. Uh, when we have essentially desktop publishing, which allows experimentation which are a much lower degree of risk. And I'm using the term risk to mean the effort that the designer puts in trying out something new. Because in everything up to the previous version, the development of typefaces is expensive in terms of effort. It involves mechanical production that is associated to specific typesetting systems. It's part of a vertically integrated system that is expensive in the investment for new typefaces. Whereas once you shift into a model where typefaces are independent products, where you do not need to invest in machinery, in capital equipment, other than a, a, a desktop, to produce them, the risk in producing one more variation just drops hugely. And the invention and innovation that we see from the mid 80s onwards is directly associated with this lower you know, business risk. So you do see people essentially getting photographer and, a, and an Apple Macintosh and trying out new things. This is a capture from a specimen from 1999. Uh, it's a bit later compared to the revolution, but Greece is a little bit slower in catching up in this respect. But what we see is first of all the idea that you can have a variety of shapes. So you see local designers picking up on the ideas that Western designers are producing, at this time pirating quite intensely Western fonts and opening them up and coming up with two versions. You also see that pretty much everything now has a paired Latin simply because the demand for them from the market is for documents that include both scripts, mostly for packaging, advertising, and so on. So this is a type, an outline from a timepiece of its time. Those who are professional typeface designers, try not to bring your breakfast up. Uh, but what you see here is exactly what was going on at the time. For about 10 years, we have a lot of timepieces that are like this, uh, where you have these completely random points, because they are auto-traced, or they're sampled, yeah. or they are pieced together from other bits. Now, this is very interesting because it means that together with the lowering of the risk in trying out new things, you have a technology that allows people to experiment without requiring a very high degree of skill. If you are trained minimally as a graphic designer, you can work with Illustrator or Freehand or whatever equivalent, Corel Draw probably at the time, <laughs> and you can understand how to manipulate outlines. And therefore, it's not so difficult to come up with something like this and if at the low resolution environment that you're working at the time, these things don't render too well, maybe your clients don't understand what's going on. Also, you're in an environment where the idea of quality criteria don't exist. So there's nobody that tells you, well, maybe you shouldn't have all these points there that are corner points and they're not in a line and half of them are not needed. And maybe this kind of a bump is not good design because you're the very first person doing these things. And this is not a great privilege. You find this throughout, where you're having a new generation of people experimenting with digital technology. The interesting thing here is that if you're making a Greek uh, typeface, you import a lot of ready-made shapes from your Latin typeface that you pirated, uh, and you can actually copy-paste things quite easily. And copy-pasting is built into the nature of the programs you use. It's also faster and easier. Now. 
you can see the kind of process going on here applying to quite a lot of other scripts. Uh, it would apply certainly in Armenian, it would apply in Cyrillic, it can apply in Hebrew, it can apply in a lot of things where a deconstructive approach to forms is enabled by this kind of technology. That's perfectly fine. The problem is that not everything you can do in a very open technology is necessarily a good thing to do. Uh, now, uh, this brings us to uh, 19, around 1997-98. This is Minion Greek. Minion is interesting because at the time, Unicode begins to happen. Uh, for the younger people in the audience, 1998 is a world away. But this is the time when uh, our world begins to move out of being a collection of small villages into being a network of people who interact with each other. International transactions and documents start to mean something. Unicode is beginning to be a thing. Uh, fonts that maybe are used for documents that might be shipped across countries are a thing. The internet begins to become not just a gimmick or a novelty, but some of the people use for the work. Uh, and all the shortcomings of technologies that did not allow an efficient transaction of documents really come to the fore. So there's a very big pressure for people to develop resources that support properly Unicode environments and especially international transactions. Uh, at the heart of this is this combination of open type fonts uh, that correctly respect some Unicode blocks. And of course, Adobe's business plan builds right into this. At the time, there is uh, a lot of fragmentation in the market for applications for designers, which is very consistently shifting into first pan-European uh, applications, uh, and then eventually global applications. So you get one product shipping out of the box, or eventually being downloaded that can support all your documents, rather than just your Greek market, your German market, your Polish market, and so on. So you need a font that will do this. Uh, now for Adobe, uh, fonts are not what they are for most people. They don't really make money from the fonts. The fonts are enabling resources for people to use their applications. If you want to use Photoshop, you need some fonts to render stuff. So core fonts for Adobe serve the function of making sure that their applications are used by designers, service bureaus, typesetters, without any problems. In a sense, if you have a good set of fonts that ship with all the Adobe applications, then your service bureau knows that your documents will run through their workflow with no problem. So having good core fonts is really critical for Adobe. Minion Pro is the first open type font that has a proper pan-European character set. And that's, let's say, the first version of what is a pan-European character set, which would mean uh, Greek, Cyrillic, and extended Latin to some degree. And because of Adobe's development environment, has the capacity to be developed with enough care. Now, this is interesting because this is the first time you have somebody saying, what does a typist that cover the whole European region include? What does Cyrillic mean for a European environment in the 21st century? How far do you go in including all the different variations of Cyrillic that people made in Bulgaria or Serbia or and so on? What is a Greek character set? What is a Latin character set for the whole of, uh, of Europe? How far do you go in supporting the ILX special conditions and so on? So these are problems that nobody has solved before at the time. You might have a lot of local solutions, usually by academics who need to type specific documents. But an academic kind of document is not necessarily representative of what the market for Adobe's product is. And also, it might be usually quite a slice of stuff. So you might have someone looking at Greek, or looking at Polish, or looking at Bulgarian, but not all together in one whole. So these are completely novel environments. The other thing is that Adobe ships families of stuff. So they do ship coordinated things. And if you have, for example, an Italian or Greek, you need to figure out well, what is an appropriate italic for a typeface that has a certain historical reference. Now, Minion says, oh, this is a Garamond style text typeface with a Robert Slimbach style take on it. <laughs> well, what is an italic for a script that doesn't have a historical equivalent from 16th century typeface? And maybe Robert Slimbach's take on it needs to be invented from scratch at that point. 
So these are very interesting design problems. Uh, you all have to see how do you modify things that might give identity to a typeface that have no equivalence to other parts of the typeface. So if you have something that is relying in the Latin specifically on serif shape, but you have a script, uh, in the case of the Greek, that doesn't really have a serif. The concept of a serif is a non-starter in Greek. It's an invention by people who were lazy in their thinking. Uh, so if you say, oh, I've got something like this in the Latin, and it's so easy to copy-paste it there, maybe that's not the best thing to do. And the good thing with Adobe is they will put the time in and the effort to think it through. So then maybe you go back to the roots of the script, and in the case of Robert, that is quite uh, close to the way that he works in uh, looking at the written forms, and maybe come up with a shape that will have an equivalent degree of darkness of the, on the page, but will have a more a closer affinity to the roots of the form. So you might then see something that has a written shape form rather than a constructed shape form from a different tool. So this idea of building typographic competence without having uh, identical shapes is something that indicates this the process of maturity in typeface design and understanding that the typeface would really work at the level of the paragraph rather than the level of the glyph. Uh, you also have the problem that Adobe ships also optical sizes. <coughs> so uh, Minion uh, start coming four optical sizes, caption, regular text, uh, subheads, and display. Now again, this kind of problem is completely new for a lot of scripts and Greek words, uh, very much in this case. The idea of a caption Greek uh, that is related to a display Greek doesn't exist until that point. This is a completely novel discussion. You're sitting and you're having these kinds of telephone conversations at the time, and nobody has up to that point considered how do I relate a caption Greek to a display Greek. There is no such thing. So how do I deal with counters that were never, uh, that never went through a process of developing for really small sizes? How do I relate these to counters that might be related stylistically but only intended to be used at display sizes? This is a very interesting. You have a statement of what Minion is. And it ships in 1998, and it says, this is what we think at this time is a good interpretation of a pan-European typeface that respects to the best that we can do at that time uh, the roots of the scripts, but updates them so that they will work typographically for this document that we want you to type so today. And once you have a reference point, a number of things happen. First of all, you can actually extend your rationale and try to produce other things. You can then give people some that they can agree or disagree with or extend and so on. You actually create a cultural moment that then shifts typographic discussion. Now, this one, the first one, is the Greek Omicron of uh, Minion problem. In the next few years, uh, Robert Slimbach developed two more extended typefaces, Garamond Premier Pro and Armon Pro. And Garamond went further back to the roots and tried to be much closer to the style of the uh, 16th uh, century. And what we see there, the red outline is the same all from the beginning, is that in that case, the horizontal stress of the traditional Greek style was maintained. So you have what is theoretically the same shape in terms of topology is exactly the same thing. It's a donut. But there you have a much smaller counter, a horizontal stress, that resonates closer to the roots of the script. Now this is appropriate for a style of writing that generally compresses the counters and reinforces the uh, extenders to the folds. The third one is Arno Pro, which was almost like a compromise between the two. It was like, oh, I've done something that is a first step. I've done something that is quite close to the roots, and now I'm doing something that is perhaps a hybrid of the two. And in this case, you can see a slightly more conventional stress, but actually much more compressed counter. So you can see the recognition that perhaps handling the balance between the white space inside and outside the letter is a critical decision in a script. Okay. Uh, this is an example of the kind of interventions that this precipitates, that you might say, how do I handle 
the wider counter space. So this is sort of before, the red is before, the black is after. And you can see the space of which typeface design operates. Now, individually, these things are insignificant. Because if you think that yeah, 12 point text is two and a half millimeters from baseline to X height, uh, this difference is probably on the limits of what you can render on a screen or on a printer, uh, certainly on the limits of what you can see. However, on a page, this little space might be 100 times. So you get these cumulative effects where small changes in how you balance the space between the counters and the surrounding space might actually be visible in a significant way. And in a sense, that's where type is design exists. Now, you could say that a lot of these changes can actually give quite a significant change to the style of the typeface, and indeed this is what we're working with. But you can also see in these uh, more important connections to the attitude of writing. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you can see that the red stroke essentially connects to an out stroke that goes up that way, whereas the black stroke connects to an out stroke that might look that way. Now, if you go back to the written form of the script, you will see that there are certain movements that are easier to make than others. And that small detail here might actually be a quite significant connection in a way of treating the general problem of an outstroke, so that it's, for example, it's a looping outstroke instead of an outgoing outstroke. And therefore, it can give you a hint for how to handle quality decisions and consistency decisions across the timeless and across its weights. So you look at how to build consistency in a family, regardless of the weight or the style of the by building consistency in the underlying movements if you have a style that is connected to this. Now, I'm showing you some of the development documents uh, of the time, and this is for, uh, for one of the later ones. But here you begin to see the problems, um, <coughs> all the yellow bits are sort of PDF posters, of ligatures. Once you have an open type font, you can say, well, why not? Because I have an environment where the forms are quite connected with written forms, ligatures were inherent in the script, I can now do them. I don't need to be limited in the character set. So how far do I go? Because by now I might have a readership that is not so much used to ligatures, so maybe my first few forms where I introduced just a few ligatures, and then you slowly build an awareness of these forms, and you explore more of these things. And then of course you have the problem of family, because if you now have a family with 16 key styles, you need to do the ligature 16 times and figure out how you would adapt it for italics and so on, and how you would build combinations of them. So these are new design problems that exactly didn't exist before these type cases. You then have the ability to say, oh, hold on, let's look at compromises that were done in the, the years early digital uh, typefaces, platform-independent digital typefaces, and try to recover things that might have been forgotten or lost or through ignorance. Not put in. So you might have a shape that did not exist in any of the typists of the 80s and the early 90s, but it's actually quite integral in Greek writing and also in Greek sign making. It's everywhere around it. So it's like a Greek ampersand. And it might look like this, or it might look like this, and so on. So you have the opportunity to enrich again the typographic palette, even though the roots of this might be quite low. Now here's a fun thing. Uh, this is a picture of a, 14, a document from 1495 and 96 uh, that David Lemon took in 2003. Uh, and he said, essentially, WTF, man, what's going on here? Because they're using all caps for, so small caps for differentiating, right? This 1496 is pretty old. Of course, if you've ever done typesetting for letterpress, you know exactly what's going on. They need to say, this is the main text, and this is the commentary all around. Uh, I've only got one typeface. I'll use this for this one, and I'll use lots of the capitals for the main text. It's a very simple experience. However, it creates this cultural moment again. Just, this is a, a reference text. If it's old enough, people pay attention to it. It's there. Let's see what's going on. Now here, uh, the annotations, in some cases, also are problems. So the problems of printing, marks shouldn't be there, and so on. But uh, at the time, we were in a sort of mm, what-if moment. Let's see what we can do with this new technology. 
Uh, and it gives you an example for how people would slap accents over capital forms to a reading, even though the convention uh, does not include uh, capitals. So we had a discussion uh, at around that time, and two things happened. First of all, we said, let's have proper polytonic in all the Greeks, and let's try and do this. Now, uh, this is what normally you would see, that you see accented, even at the time of it later, accented lowercase, and accents for initial vowels when only they are followed by lowercase. So an unaccented uh, uh, capital setting. So if you really want to think from a so convention structure point of view, Greek, Greek has three cases. It has lowercase, it has capitals that are unaccented, and it has letters that only occur in lowercase environments but take a capital form because they have an accent. So these accented capitals only exist when they're followed by lowercase forms. That's the convention. And this makes perfect sense. But that guy in Italy said, well, no, because I don't trust my readers to understand how to stress this. I'm going to stick things on top. Okay. Uh, and the problem is, this is just a quarter of the, of the characters of the uh, that you might have accented combinations for capital forms that might have, through historical uh, practice, developed in many different ways. So you might see uh, there. So you see that the letters there, they have a little a capital with a lowercase yoda, a single stroke next to it, but also one below it. These are phonetical equivalent. They're typographically equivalent. There is no difference between the two, other than in some regions, people tend to prefer one form, and in other regions, people tend to prefer another. So if you're a type-based developer, you might say, what do I do? Do I provide all the possible forms? Do I provide just one form? Am I sort of a typographic dictator? And I would say, you will only use the subscript form or the uh, subscript form, or you will use the form alongside. Or should I, as a developer of a type that's supposed to be used by many people, give you as many options as possible? Again. Adobe tends to use a sort of 99% of the time for 99% of the people approach, which is not a bad idea. <laughs> if it's not too difficult, they'll try to get it for most of the stuff most of the time. This, however, creates problems because the underlying structure of how fonts work is based on the worst possible scenario. If you think of the underlying technology for typesetting and fonts, it's essentially Anglo-American. This is the worst possible scenario in the world because the form of language used by those communities is the simplest in terms of the use of the Latin script. It doesn't even have many diacritics. So you have typesetting systems and formats developed for a very simple form of typographic expression. It would be different if, I don't know, if Poland was the source of all typesetting systems that we were using because they have a lot of deck critics and more common forms. It would be way more interesting if the typesetting systems we're using were developed with, say, well, you know, some of the Indian scripts as the number one priority because they're complex enough to do other stuff easier. So we always have a lot of hacks. The problem with case conversion that I identified is a problem because you have in Greece in Greek, essentially a three case system, but you have engineering approaches that deal with two systems, lowercase and capital, you have a problem. Germans in the room are very intimate with the problems of the capitalist set, yes? Uh, and we have seen similar cases in other scripts because the systems we use assume that you case convert. And you have a lowercase form and a capital form, and Unicode doesn't like MP slots. You need to have something there. I don't have views on the German case conversion issue. I do have views on other scripts that might need case conversion, and suddenly glyphs appear for things that never had two forms. And of course, our routines for changing things from lowercase to capital assume parity, a one-to-one -one relation between the lowercase form and the capital. But in Greek, that doesn't happen. So when you, have, when you apply the normal routines, you will see a lot of their critics appearing in the middle of the capital form, so that is a big problem. So you need additional sets of forms to allow for typesetting of uh, Greek capital forms on the top. Uh, actually, if you want to scare 
uh, someone at the InDesign and type department, Adobe, you just go and whisper Greek case conversion <laughs> while they're sleeping and they're going to have nightmares. Because it's a non-linear system, it's algorithmically extremely difficult to express. It depends very much on the context. And also, Greek uses a lot of rules that depend on the combinations of vowels, which again are not very easy to express in algorithms. And essentially, the font technology that we have is not built to cater for our kind of complexity. The intelligence in OpenType is not just that it can deal with this. You would need the font to talk to the text engine, and that is something that doesn't really happen. Of course, if you're Adobe, you're like a huge behemoth. People pay attention to what you're doing. They will look at your character sets, they will look at your open type routines, and they see how you deal things. And then you see things like this. Because if you're not sure, you look at how other people you trust do things, which is obvious. If you're not sure how to be Greek, you look at someone who knows Greek and writes Greek. If you're not sure how to do something, you look at someone that you think knows what they're doing and you copy what they do. So if Adobe puts accents on capitals, maybe Jeremy Tucker says, hmm, not a bad idea. I will put accents on capitals. Now, here's this interesting thing that happens. Up to about that point, you don't have an explicit demand for capitalized Greek in modern Greek typesetting. It is something that came out of it. Uh, we need to edit this out probably, but you know when you're, you're having a drink with some friends and you're having some ideas, and at the point that you're having the drink, the idea sounds amazing, <laughs> and the next morning you should have said, <laughs> no. <laughs> this was that idea about accents on polytonics, essentially. Uh, sorry, polytonic accents on small capital Greek, <coughs> Greek which is an engineering nightmare. Uh, it recreates a serious work overload. It's a very interesting design problem uh, and can get out of context. Now, for Adobe, Greek type development is not a design service. It was, for many things, and font engineering development platform. In a sense that, oh, if we can get Greek to do stuff, then we know how to do a lot of other things. So we'll put the resource in figuring out how to do case conversion in Greek because that will help us understand how to solve complex problems uh, in our fonts. Fine. Jeremy's not in that game. He's producing fonts for people to use them. So people get these fonts, and then they see, oh, hold on. Stuff. I can do things with these things. And you begin to see things like that. Now, this is a detail from a poster from a fairly typical uh, Greek theater play. Uh, and we see it's sort of lowercase there, there's some letter. And then at the top, in Trajan Greek, that is, this is an, an anomaly. There's no, Trajan Greek should be something that your voice box should not say. <laughs> uh, and it's got accents. Now, this is interesting because if you type some Greek in all capitals, uh, there are many words that are identically spelled and mean very different things, and you can only tell them apart if you get the stress correct. Uh, so uh, that word there, the, the sort of last word at the top, could be pronounced as stress of the first syllable or the last syllable, and it means completely different things. Uh, then you see words that might have roots in classical Greek that increasingly we see that the designers have been not trusting the audience to read. Uh, that's because uh, the teaching of classical Greek in schools has gone down. It's been taken out of a lot of classes. It's been seen as a bit of uh, specialism. So you get people less familiar with terminology that uses classical Greek forms. So the readership cannot be trusted to do things right. Recently also, we've seen a lot of Greek uh, brands and firms uh, intentionally selecting classical Greek words uh, for the brands. That is very much a cultural moment, because we're saying, oh, we're in a crisis. Uh, it's the foreigners that are getting to us, and we want to show how proud we are in our heritage. The best way to do it is to pick for your brand, your, your bakery, or whatever. <laughs> it, I'm not joking. Bakeries that are using variation of forms that are classical Greek, ancient Greek in form, because this reminds you of the Greekness of the brand, rather than something that is an imported thing, which you will see 20 years earlier. Again, you have an environment where more classical Greek forms are being used in an environment where fewer people can be trusted to read them well. And because a lot of lettering is in capitals, then you get more and more of these things. And you know what? Your fonts support it. So you can do it more easily. So now you begin to see this combination of incidental development 
and gradual changes in the leadership and the culture producing very visible changes in the documents. Now, Minion Pro is being redesigned. Now, it's been redesigned essentially 20 years after its original uh, design. Uh, by this time, Robert has done uh, Dominion, Garamond, uh, Arno, so three typefaces on similar themes. Uh, he's done Adobe Text, uh, which is a much drier typographic version of the style. He's had enough time to reflect on things, plus done some uh, Type Greek type is in a very different style. So he's approaching the same design with a much more informed and perhaps um, complex viewpoint. So he said, there's no one way to do this thing. There might be two ways to do this thing. And I don't need to have to decide between a more, let's say, upright or a more horizontal style. And I'm going to do two of them because I can. That's actually a nice position to be in. So what you see here are two different versions of the same typeface. The, the typeface will ship with two versions. Uh, and we have developed these two so that since the user can get a choice between the two. Uh, now I'm using the PDF because I have no idea how to get the alternates in Keynote. <laughs> I can't have an alternate in Keynote. Uh, but if you look at the forms up and down, then you can see that the overall proportions are the same. The space management is very similar, but the stress is different. Because you have these small cumulative effects that will give a slightly different texture on the paragraph, but the paragraph will not significantly reflow uh, at all. And you can see perhaps a more typographic or a more calligraphic take in there. Now, this for me is interesting because it also means that the attitude is a bit more confident. It says you don't need to take a very strong decision about whether to be more, uh, to be closer to the written forms or closer to more constructed forms, you can actually have a design space. And if the recent years have taught us anything about Greek, is that actually it is a quite an accommodating script that can take quite a lot of interpretations, especially in a modulated script where there is complexity in the forms. And then you can give the power to the designer to choose. Now, my guess is that this will be a similar culture at the moment. It will actually give people uh, the opportunity to say, if not, Talk. And you can see perhaps a more typographic or a more calligraphic table there. Now, this for me is interesting because it also means that the attitude is a bit more confident. It says you don't need to take a very strong decision about whether to be more, uh, to be closer to the written forms or closer to more constructed forms. You can actually have a design space. And if the recent years have taught us anything about Greek, is that actually it is a quite an accommodating script that can take quite a lot of interpretations, especially in a modulated script where there is complexity in the forms. And then you can give the power to the designer to choose. Now, my guess is that this will be a similar culture at the moment. It will actually give people uh, the opportunity to say, I will use this form or that form, or I will use, for example, oh, you can see there, it's in the intercepts of the theta, or I would use a more calligraphic form of the kappa, which is more connected to the written forms, and so on. Uh, or I will not. And since the typeface designer there almost absorbs responsibility from determining the typographic voice of the document, but provides well-developed, high-quality resources to the document designer to make their own choice. Now, the interesting thing with this is that, of course, it will have the full range of optical sizes and weights and so on, and all the characters. So it's a bit of a monster. Uh, but it provides, again, this reference point that other designers can position themselves against. And exactly because it ships with everything Adobe ships or downloads now, uh, it's on everybody's machine. And there's a very big difference between the stuff that uh, OEM manufacturers and uh, Adobe do in that respect, that everybody gets to see that stuff. So this shows you that our idea of what is modern uh, actually changes quite a lot. And we can think of what I will be talking about. First of all, we're talking about ideas that change, that what is correct or incorrect is not something that you can define. You can only say that at this point in time, in this typographic environment, people tend to use this more or this less, or people tend to think about typefaces in a specific way. That there is no gospel about how typefaces should be formed. 
uh, often when you hear these kind of statements, this tells you more about the person who makes the statements rather than the actual forms themselves. It also tells you that you cannot really separate typefaces from the documents that they are used in. The forms themselves, they might be for nerds like the audience, but they really don't matter out there. What you have to see out there is that the guy that's making the poster says, oh look, accents, I'm going to use them simply because I can, even if it was never intended. So if you look at the typographic practice all around you, you get a much better idea of how people think about the form of the script and how they interpret the potential in typefaces. You will, for example, see that people regularly underuse the full range of weight differences, differentiations that typeface designs provide. They're much more conservative in this than, say, using the full nine styles that the main type is giving you now. Uh, but they might explore character set differences and so on. It also shows you that a typeface in itself doesn't tell you very much about how well designed it is or not. But the motivations of the designer and the research that has gone into things and the testing is not visible in the forms. You need to ask questions about what is a well-formed shape or what is a well-formed combination of shapes in each environment. And these things exist separate from the typeface. You need to make these things visible. So in a sense, what is a high-quality typeface in a specific environment is something that we as typeface designers don't actually spend enough time talking about. And we could. The last thing has to do with this constant search for innovation and identity, that it is a process that keeps changing, and for the same script might change very much on the conditions. So modernity in literature printing might be very different from modernity and in innovation in advertising and packaging. It might be very different for something that is supposed to exist on my phone here that I'm perhaps not expected to pay too much attention to because I just need to get the job done. So there is no single access alone which these things can be judged. And it's a more nuanced discussion. It's a more complex argument than you need to give yourself time. It's also deeply personal, because each person making typefaces or making decisions about typefaces carry their own baggage of decisions and personal histories of decisions that inform the viewpoint. The same way we can see in the Adobe typefaces, the same designer taking quite different approaches in the forms over a span of time. That doesn't mean that decisions were wrong or that they are right, it means that at the time that they were made, they were deemed to meet the requirements of the project. There's always some sort of, at least implied brief behind each typeface. So if there's any take, we can take from any level we can take from these examples, is that you cannot really set objective criteria for the quality of a typeface on its own. You need to look at it in the context of its development, and in the context of the documents in which it is being used and which inspired its use. On its own, actually not a very interesting object to look at. You need to see it in the context of the people who make it. There's agents, stakeholders, who might have a say in it, and also these things might influence very much how the type is being used. So you see the change in the use of a type is all the time. Having a, having a layer of meaning that you cannot predict at the start of the typeface. That is why we cannot see an end to typefaces simply because every new typeface carries this element of unknown about whether it will actually capture this combination of needs and desires. It also shows you that there is a huge amount of space for people exploring. And especially as we get better at producing typefaces easily with better tools and so on, you can be better at exploring the design space in each script and the combinations of scripts in a way that is informed but also pushes at the limits of what your readership might be expected to see. Now, the tricky thing is to do it in an informed uh, way that puts in time to do research, to do the development properly, so you have a reason for your decisions rather than just, oh, it was easy to copy by stuff like the guys we showed in the 80s and 90s. But, if anything, there is a huge amount of space for more innovation in type-based design, especially in scripts outside the lab. And that's why those areas are much more fun for typeface designers, because the Latin is extremely well defined as a design space and fairly well populated. That's why most of the text typefaces are not that interesting. They're always revisiting very tight themes. Whereas in the non Latin space, this idea of having, oh, let's have 16 different styles for the same kind of typeface that does optical sizes and does all sorts of different tones of voice is, in many ways, unexplored or just begins to get explored. And the only logical conclusion is that 
a few years down the line, pretty much every script will be able to have a typographic palette that is as complex as any uh, Latin typeface. If we don't see this, I think we're just being uh, willfully blind. What will, however, be interesting to see is not how will all the non-Latin scripts match onto the Latin scripts. So having typographic complexity doesn't mean, oh, I need something that will have a bold and italic and a bold and italic and so on. It means that I will be able to have resources that cater to the same complexity of documents. So if I have a complex house style for a publication that has you know, eight different kinds of typographic text on a page, I should be able to have eight different typographic voices for any script in the world, even though those things might not correspond one-to-one -to, -one to establish terminology that we have on the Latin. So maybe the brief for the title says, what kinds of differentiation do I need? What different tones of voice do I need typographically for this script that are drawing differentiations from its own roots, from the modes of writing of the script, or the kinds of documents people are producing, and I can adapt these to a modern environment with some informed choices. And maybe I need to invent words to call things that might be formal or informal and so on that are appropriate to each script. But the next few years should see quite a lot of invention in this area, and I think we should be welcoming this. 